So at the beginning of 1913, we're going to have the first Democrat elected to the presidency besides Grover Cleveland since before the Civil War. And that's going to be this Woodrow Wilson. Now, as we mentioned, Woodrow Wilson is yet another progressive. Woodrow Wilson believed that it was a government's responsibility to regulate the economy and in some ways, you know, help out the little guy. Again, the Democratic Party had made this transition in 1896 to become this economic reform party. As part of this, Wilson is actually going to appoint William Jennings Bryan as his uh, Secretary of State. So he is an economic reformer. Again, the Democrats, social reform, they want to stay away from that because if social reform comes around, it could potentially mean racial, racial reform, which Southern white Democrats do not want that. But again, a good chunk of the Democrats are farmers. They want uh, economic reform. And so we're going to see Woodrow Wilson will absolutely bring that in his first term as president. One of the first things he's going to do it's simply a, a bureaucratic matter. He's going to take that Department of Commerce and Labor created by Teddy, and to make it more efficient, he's going to create a separate Department of Commerce and a separate Department of Labor to sort of make it easier to uh, monitor economic issues. The big thing that Wilson's going to do, or the two big things he's going to do, one is going to be in Feb, uh, 1913, one is going to be in 1914, are, are going to be dealing with major economic issues. The first thing is in 1913 and it's going to be something called the Federal Reserve Act. So the American economy has been in dramatic fluctuation really since the United States started. Part of this is because uh, the economy depends on how much gold is available in circulation if new gold mines are discovered. Uh, as we talked about after uh, William Jennings Bryan failed to win the presidency, the U.S. went on the gold standard. And so basically the U.S. is printing money out, but they make sure the amount of money is based on gold. So the U.S. government would acquire gold. They would print out money for how much gold they have in Fort Knox or wherever they're securing it. And they couldn't print out more money. Uh, unless they got more gold. And so basically this meant more money's out there if there's more gold in circulation, circulation, which caused massive inflation and deflation based on sort of an arbitrary measure. If, if somebody finds gold, we government's easier to acquire gold, so there's more money. That's kind of crazy. And so goods could go up and down based on gold discoveries. Well, people realized how difficult that could be to manage an economy that constantly goes up and down. So in order to control the money supply and provide some regulation of the economy, in 1913, Wilson or Congress will pass and Wilson will approve something called the Federal Reserve Act. And what the Federal Reserve Act does is incredibly complicated, so I'm going to oversimplify it, but it creates an independent body that will determine how much money should be in circulation. So if you're having increased inflation then uh, where the price of goods are going up the government should limit the amount of money in circulation if um, and I might be getting this opposite but if there's a uh, price of goods is going down more money in circulation uh, to make the price of goods go up you don't just print out if there's more gold out there you print out based on uh, inflation and deflation in the economy a lot more complicated than that but it's basically meant to prevent price fluctuations that have been plaguing the U.S. economy since the beginning and especially since the gold standard. It creates a new currency uh, system and uh, this board created by the Federal Reserve Act regulates uh, uh, currency interest rates, that type of thing. All right, so that's one major economic reform Wilson will uh, preside over. Another one, and this is 1914, so his second year of the presidency, he's going to create the Federal Trade Commission Act. Okay, so Federal Trade Commission. What the FTC is, is something that Teddy had actually proposed. So when um, we talked about the Gilded Age, we talked about these monopolies and these corporations creating these huge trusts that would uh, monopolize, take over you know, industry, price gouge, and use their power to suppress competition. We had seen Teddy use the um, Bureau of Corporations to rip apart these companies using the Sherman Antitrust Act. Taft had done that as well. Well, the issue with that is that sometimes you would rip apart these companies, 
that and prevent them from uh, you would hurt business at, overseas chances. So you're doing this. You're ripping apart the company to prevent monopolization at home and to prevent unfair competition at home. But it also hurt business overseas. So you need big business if you're competing at the world stage. You don't want to rip apart a company because that would make it less effective in competing with Britain, France, other countries around the world. So you want to regulate it, but you don't want to destroy it. Basically, politicians came to the understanding that you can't have monopolies, price gouging, but you and unfair competition at home, but you also want big companies to compete at the world stage. Well, what Wilson is going to do, and this is interesting because when he ran in 1912, he basically said, I'm going to continue trust busting. Instead, he's going to adopt the idea of simply regulating business. What the FTC will do is if a company crosses interstate lines, the federal government can now regulate it, meaning that they can investigate it for you know, price gouging, monopolistic practices, things like false advertising. That FTC does that as well. And if they find that they're violating certain laws, the government can step in and fine it. Now, not rip it apart, but fine it. Maybe also do stock sell-offs, that type of thing. But basically, they can step in and, and regulate it, not rip it apart. Again, ripping apart, maybe that we, we went too far with that, but we do need this regulation. So what the uh, Fed, FTC will do is it's going to absorb that Bureau of Corporations. Remember, the Bureau of Corporations was just an investigatory body. Once it investigates, they apply the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, charge the company, then break it apart. The FTC will be like the Bureau of Corporations, and then it can investigate malpractice in business, but it can also has teeth. You don't need to use the Sherman Antitrust Act. The government will give it the power to investigate and levy punishment against these companies. So regulate, don't destroy. The FTC will be passed under Wilson, and again, uh, it's going to regulate all interstate business. Teddy had, had initially talked about this, and here Democrat Wilson is going to uh, adopt as part of his platform. Now, Wilson is going to be a little hesitant on social reform issues. So he's happy to sign FTC uh, into law. He was happy to find the Federal Reserve Act. But some people are going to be calling on him to step in on social issues like child labor laws. Now, are child labor laws, is that an economic problem or is that a social problem? Well, you know, Wilson will actually uh, understand it as an economic problem. And he's going to sign into law something called the Keating Owen Child Labor Act in 1916. And basically, Wilson doesn't believe it's right to uh, employ children under a cer certain age. You don't give them a fair chance in life. And so he's going to pass into law. And what this will do is it's going to use the federal power to regulate interstate business to say that um, companies crossing interstate lines can't use children under the age of 14 as laborers. So if you're a major corporation, you cross interstate lines, you can't employ children under the age of 14. Uh, this Keating Owen Child Labor Act um, uh, what will be put into law. One thing Wilson is hesitant to pass, however, is um, women's uh, an amendment, national amendment, giving women the right to vote. Wilson, I believe he doesn't think women should get the right to vote, but he's going to do what politicians do when there's an issue that's incredibly divisive. So they don't want to say they're in favor of it because they know they're going to lose votes from people that uh, are not in favor of something. Uh, but they also, also don't want to say they're not in favor of something because they know they'll lose votes for those who are in favor of it. So what Wilson is going to do um, when a lot of women, these suffragettes, will start calling on him to pass a national amendment saying states can't take away the right to vote based on sex, Wilson's going to talk out both sides of his mouth. He will say, I am personally for women getting the right to vote, but I think states should decide it. This is the exact same response you would get out of politicians who didn't want to make a decision in gay marriage. You would, they would say, I don't want to lose votes from people that are against gay marriage, and I don't want to lose votes from people that are for gay marriage. So they would say, we'll let the, this be a state matter. Basically, that's a non-answer, and you don't lose any votes. That's going to be women's response when women start pressuring Wilson for this national amendment. He says, I'm for it, but I think the states should decide it, so nobody can get mad at him. So again, 
this is a social issue. He sort of shies away from it. Um, and this is how Wilson is going to run from 1912 to 1916. Economic reform, but slow on social reform. So we see, a, again, another progressive candidate as president, although the way he's progressive is going to be very different or slightly different than the presidents that came before him. Before we end this progressive era, I should talk about and bring up the fact that it's not just going to be politicians that are progressive. We're actually going to have what you would describe as progressive, um, progressive businessmen. You'll see some businessmen come out in the progressive era that are going to determine that maybe the labor practices in the Gilded Age were not only bad for the worker, they were actually bad for the companies. One of the guys that's going to make this decision that maybe helping your workers actually helps the business is this guy right here. His name's Henry Ford. Henry Ford uh, was born in, in, in 1863 near Detroit, Michigan. Just like all these other inventors that uh, we talk about, Henry Ford is one of these kids that's constantly a asking questions. He, he didn't get a lot of schooling except from his mom. But one of his, uh, the main way he got his education was like Edison and Tesla, taking apart stuff, putting it back together. And that's how he's going to spend a lot of his young life, reading, that type of thing. Well, as a teenager, uh, Ford will start working with motors and combustion engines. So a combustion engine is nothing new. Combustion engines are the idea of taking a fuel or fuel source and causing basically a controlled explosion. And this controlled explosion drives pistons, which then uh, you can use to create mechanical energy. So if you go into a car, spoiler, we're getting there, and you uh, inject gas, what happens is when the gas is injected, it creates an explosion, controlled explosion, and the pistons uh, create mechanical energy. These things had been around for a while, but uh, Henry Ford is going to start experimenting with them, and he's going to develop ways to make these combustion engines more efficient. Um, eventually, uh, his work with combustion engines is going to bring him to the attention of Edison. Edison will hire him at his Menlo Park laboratory, and he's going to work at Menlo Park for a while until he saves up enough money to break away from Menlo Park and form his own company. When Ford forms his own company in the late uh, 1800s, he's going to come up initially with a very bad idea. He comes up with the idea for something called a quadricycle. What a quadricycle is, is a vehicle that's a combustion engine. You load it with gasoline, a fuel, and what it will do is it only seats one, maybe two people, and it's almost like a luxury vehicle. Think of it almost like an ATV in that there's not any practical purpose other than looking cool or having fun. Basically, this uh, a quadricycle, you can ride it around town, you can uh, you know, uh, show it off to your friends, but you can't have people ride with you simply because there's not very much space. You can't carry any luggage, any items in it. It doesn't go long distances, simply doesn't have the gas to do it. And because of the way that Ford manufactures it, the cost to produce these quadricycles is incredibly expensive. So the only people that are going to buy these quadricycles are the very wealthy. So Henry Ford produces these things slowly. He doesn't sell very many of them because the cost of producing these things is a lot. And the only people that buy them are robber barons, the handful of people with expendable capital in late 1800s United States. Well, Henry Ford is going to learn a lot of lessons from this quadricycle. One of these lessons is going to be, if I can make this thing in bulk, mass produce it, I can make it a lot cheaper. But if I mass produce it, I need to find a bigger audience. I can't just sell it to rich people. I need to produce something that average Joe Schmo wants and can afford. And if he can afford it and he buys it, more people that buy it, the more production costs can get lower. This opens up more customers. The more customers, the better. So Henry Ford is going to shut down quadricycle production, and he's going to start working on automobiles. And he's going to come up with this idea for this uh, Model T automobile that's practical, and it's something that ca average Joe Schmo can afford, not just a luxury vehicle for the wealthy. Now, Henry Ford is not the first to produce automobiles. A guy named Carl Benz had been doing it in Germany before. People have been trying this uh, rail list, you know, railroads before. Um, but Henry Ford is going to come up with an idea for a vehicle that is affordable and practical. 
And what he's going to do in 1903 is he's going to get a number of investors together, and he's going to create Ford Motor Company in his hometown of Detroit in 1893, or I'm sorry, 1903, with the idea of producing an affordable and uh, uh, practical vehicle that average Joe can, can afford. And one of the things that Henry Ford is going to do at his uh, motor company is he's going to create a way to uh, produce this much cheaper by producing the car on an assembly line. So he's going to come up with a, its initially steam-powered assembly line. What it'll do is um, it's going to move from one station to the next where you're going to have different individuals work on different parts of the car. When Henry Ford was producing his quadricycle, he would basically throw a bunch of parts at Tom, throw a bunch of parts at Steve, and say, Steve produced a quadricycle, Tom produced a quadricycle. And what he would notice is, Steve did great at certain parts, but then he would be really slow when producing, say, the steering for the quadricycle. Tom would do great at the wheels, but do a bad job when it got to engines. Joe, good job at the engines, bad parts, steering wheel, or whatever. Well, what uh, Henry Ford's going to do, if I make stations then I can put Tom here at the wheels because he's really good at wheels. Then I can put Bill on the seats because Bill's really good at putting in seats. Uh, John on the engine because he's really good at the engine. And this will maximize efficiency. So instead of Bill, Tom producing one quadricycle a day, um, or instead of in this situation producing one automo automobile a day, um, we'll be able to produce uh, more automobiles because you station the guys where they're the quickest, most efficient, so they can just move down this line a lot more rapidly. So, Tom, you can put these tires on incredibly uh, quickly. You do that. Uh, bill your seats. And so this, these cars are going to be churning out again, whereas if these guys are working on it independently, maybe they could produce seven automobiles a day, but because they're working on their specialized uh, area, they're going to produce, I'm making this number up, 21 automobiles today. The same amount of work, but you're putting people where they're the most efficient. So that's one thing that uh, Henry Ford's going to do that other automobile manufacturers hadn't done at this point. If you're producing more, you're producing them quicker, you can obviously sell them much cheaper. So that's one thing Henry Ford is going to do uh, differently at Ford Motor Company. Another thing he'll do is he's going to start paying his workers much better then they could get an equivalent industry. So Henry Ford's going to be the first major automobile uh, manufacturer in the United States. But let's say Tom here that put, puts on the wheels, you know, uh, if he went to work for a railroad company, again, making this numbers up, but he would get $2 a day to put on railroad wheels or cars on railroad wheels. Well, Henry Ford's going to determine, I'm going to pay a minimum wage of $5 for equivalent work, and I'm basically going to pay my workers twice as much as they would make in competing industries. Now, if you're trying to make cars cheaper and more efficiently, it doesn't seem like it would make sense to double the pay of your workers. But what Henry Ford is thinking here is that if he becomes known as the guy that pays the best, he's going to get the best workers from around the country flocking to him. So maybe Tom, you know, I'm paying him a lot. Maybe. Joe from, I need to quit using these names, maybe um, uh, Jason from uh, the train company, he'll quit his job in California or something like that, and he'll come to work for me because he knows I'm going to pay him twice as much. So I will get the best workers if I pay more. Not only that, in this welfare capitalism, taking care of the welfare of your workers, but if I pay my workers enough, they might become customers. So what Henry Ford wants to do is sell more cars because if he knows the more cars he sells, the more he can invest in his company. If he pays his workers enough, they'll start buying the cars. If they buy the cars, that's another car sold, more money invested in the company, and I can make it maybe a more efficient assembly line than I ever could before. So he implements uh, this assembly line, starts paying his workers better, uh, again, twice as much as, as competing uh, companies, $5 a day is going to be the minimum wage in his thing, in, in his factory. Now, this is going to end up being an effective strat strategy. Now, there's probably limits to welfare capitalism, but Henry Ford's not going to see this initially because he's the only person in town employing it, and basically his workers will be happy, they'll buy his automobiles, 
the company's going to get off its ground, start selling, and then the more they sell, the more efficient the cars become, the more you can sell because now you're selling them cheaper, and then the more uh, you can invest in your company. And we'll see that Henry Ford will essentially start an industry where none had existed before. As a matter of fact, the United States starts leading the automobile industry incredibly easy. Um, basically, uh, U.S. is going to, if you want to buy a car and you want to pay a reasonable price for it, you're going to buy it from Henry Ford. Now, very quickly, Ford will see competition in terms of Chevrolet, Dodge, that type of thing pop up. But he is uh, the main game in town, uh, at least at first, because uh, of his production methods. And he is going to start getting automobiles in the hands of the average American. So Joe Farmer, who could only get his crop to market on railroads, he's really appreciating things like the Hepburn Act because it lowers railroad rates. But now he doesn't even need to go through the railroad anymore because you get a couple farmers together. Maybe the local Grange buys a truck from these guys. Now they can get their crops to market without putting it on a barge, sending it down the river, or without a railroad. So if the railroad tries to charge too much, um, you know, then, then you can get it to market on your car. Uh, we'll also see cars will expand where people can travel before the idea of vacation was somewhat uh, crazy because you're having to hop on a train or boats or something. But now if you're a, a lower class or probably more middle class family, you can afford one of these automobiles and you can go beyond where you live. Most Americans uh, around this time uh, worked where they lived and then they wouldn't go much beyond uh, where they grew up, uh, wouldn't go on vacation very often. But now you've got this affordable vehicle uh, uh, to take you these places. This is absolutely going to trans uh, transform transportation in the United States, and it's going to be this industry where the United States will start to dominate. So Henry Ford is going to be one of many examples of this welfare capitalism replacing this Gilded Age capitalism. Um, one of the things you'll often hear about Henry Ford, though, is uh, uh, some of the criticisms, like he can spy on his, his employees. That's absolutely true. Um, he is not going to have kind things to say about certain ethnicities. Uh, uh, Henry Ford is also going to be a supporter of what you would call social Darwinism for the era. Uh, Henry Ford's not unique in this, okay? He's sort of unique in the, his implementation of welfare capitalism and these new methods of capitalism, but he's not unique in his support of social Darwinism. And as a matter of fact, this is going to be one of these dark topics that are going to come along with the progressive era. So during the progressive era, you had people that wanted to use the power of the government and, you know, I shouldn't exclusively the power of the government, but local organizations to improve society. And for the most part, this is going to be beneficial to the average American. Most Americans are going to see an improvement in their life. Uh, they're going to be more economic social mobility during uh, this progressive era. But there are some things that this progressive era is going to bring about that are going to have consequences and, and we sort of look back and cringe at. One of these is going to be this idea of social Darwinism. Now this is going to actually emerge in the late 1800s based on the ideas of Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin had put this theory forth of, of evolution. Basically he argued that certain creatures will survive in their environment and thrive because they're adapted to suit their environment. So if you have a bird with one kind of beak and a bird with another kind of beak and the bird with, um, you know, maybe a genetic mutation, this beak allows it to, uh, you know, eat seeds in this area, whereas the other one's beak, it's difficult to get to the seeds, you know, crack the shell open. The bird with the first kind of beak is going to do better. It's going to survive. It's going to have children and its children are going to carry this mutation uh, forward and it's going to survive because it's better suited for that environment. So survival of the fittest. Now Darwin applies this ideas to animals, but you'll see some people in the late 1800s and early 1900s apply this idea to people. The idea is going to come out that certain races and ethnicities are better suited towards the modern world. Now the way they classify this, this will uh, differ from one uh, social Darwinist to the next. Um, but you know, some people will say it's based on color of your skin. Some will say it's the shape of your skull. Uh, this is sort of the social Darwin measuring test. Some people will say it's the size of your nose. 
but they're going to apply all these uh, fairly uh, arbitrary measures to, to measure a person's capability to deal with modern issues and modern societies uh, based on, again, things that seemingly have, have no relation to, to, uh, to anything, but at the time they believe they did. So social Darwinism itself is not dangerous. It's just an idea, you know, it's a sort of silly idea that people put out. The thing that's going to make this dangerous is going to be what people applying this in the early 1900s in the form of eugenics. So what eugenics is, is basically the application of social Darwinism and the measurements gonna, that are going to be put in place to limit certain people, um, to limit the uh, certain people from having children or to limit certain populations. So what we're going to see is some people will advocate for some of it's going to be childish. Some people will start advocating for certain children. They'll have eugenics parties. Well, they'll have all the neighborhood kids gather together, and the neighborhood kids will, uh, the parents will have a doctor uh, measure their heads and noses and things like that. And then the doctors will basically proclaim Billy uh, the the best eugenics child and then Sally the best eugenics child and they'll say you guys are going to produce the healthiest kids you guys are going to be um, you know the most successful in this society silly stuff like that you would also have doctors put together eugenics marriages where you know they'd find couples it was almost like reality TV and say this person has the perfect shape for uh, eugenics shape face things like that you guys should get married it's kind of funny you look that stuff up, you know, you'll see these things turn out to be disasters because you're throwing people together, probably don't like each other and uh, and seeing if that works out. But um, that kind of stuff, you know, it's, it's not, I don't even know if it's necessarily harmful, it's just kind of silly. But the thing that's going to make this eugenics harmful, and, and by the way, the thing that kind of makes eugenics really dangerous is people classifying people and basically determining you know, thinking they have the foresight to know what's best for the society, not only they live in, but future societies. Um, but what the thing that's going to make it truly dangerous is that we'll see this push, not at the national level, and this is one thing you got got to credit the United States uh, with, but private individuals and specifically local governments, specifically some state governments, will do things to limit certain populations from giving birth. Like, for example, in Virginia, we'll see the state of Virginia start a sterilization program for people convicted of violent crimes, particularly rape. When a person goes to prison, they'll be um, castrated. I don't know if I'm using the right word there, but they'll uh, be sterilized, essentially. Sterilized meaning prevent them from having children um, uh, to prevent them from, from giving birth in the future. So we start to see this at the state level. It'll be thing, uh, people convicted of crimes, uh, people with mental um, uh, retardation, uh, people that um, certain disabilities in places like Virginia and some areas, other areas of the country uh, will be prevented from, from uh, uh, sterilized so they can't have children. So you see this, and this is, again, this progressive idea that we're going to make a better society by implementing these government measures. Again, the federal government doesn't get to, uh, doesn't do anything here because enough people will start mocking this and basically saying, you know, um, one, who, how do you know what's good for the society? And other people are going to say, where do you stop? Okay, so if you say violent criminals can't have children and you say, you know, people with certain mental, mental handicaps can't have children, what about people that m might not be bright? You know, they're 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 not uh, you know uh, mentally deficient, but they might not be the brightest person. Why don't we just sterilize them? Why don't we sterilize? You know, uh, you say people of color sterilize Italians. Okay, well, we'll then sterilize this group. Then sterilize this group. At what point do you stop? And some people will question, well, why stop at sterilization? Why not just eliminate existing populations? So in the United States, a lot of people will follow eugenics, but I'd argue just as many are going to start questioning it. And because a lot of people question it and how far you can take it, 
we don't see these eugenics programs go beyond the state level. Uh, and uh, you will see that that some people will take these ideas that are put forth during the progressive era, um, ideas like sterilizing um, uh, certain populations, past the point where uh, the United States takes it. As a matter of fact, the ideas that are put forth in the Virginia pl program to uh, ster sterilize criminals and, and uh, uh, people with mental disabilities uh, will be taken by Nazi Germany and used during then because they're not going to get the question you get from the United States. So I hate to end the progressive era this way, but the progressive era, a lot of gains are being made, businesses and with politics. But there are some things where, you know, uh, society, this correction of society may have gone too far, you know, and, and, uh, and certainly are going to go too far uh, uh, in certain instances. So, again, progressive era, for the most part, I'd argue good, but there are going to be some negatives to it.